This video is going to kick off our renal block. And as you can imagine, we're going to be talking about our kidneys. These two organs on our sides that help filter our blood and our plasma, do a whole bunch of hormonal stuff, a whole bunch of stuff. But before we get into all that, we got to just talk about the general anatomy of the kidneys. So that'll be the topic of this video. So the general anatomy of the kidneys, we have these two organs on our sides. And the blood will go into there, get filtered, and will eventually drain drain into your bladder and then finally out your urethra okay so let's just look at the kidneys first the outside of the kidney we call the cortex so right cortex the inner portion of the kidneys we call the medulla let's take a cross section of the kidneys and see what's really going on here if we take a cross section of the kidneys we'll notice it's quite complicated. You have a ton of these small, 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 small tubes. And we're gonna talk about, you know, all the microscopic anatomy in the future videos, but you have all these small, small, small tubes that form kind of this pyramid. This pyramid, we call these renal pyramids. <laughs> Makes sense. And at the bottom of these pyramids, you have the renal papilla. And all these tubes will drain the fluid that we talked about into these small openings called calyces. Small calyces or minor calyces. Calyces means cup. So it, draw, it drains into these small little cups which connect to larger cups. Larger cups. You can guess what these would be called. These are called major calyces. So it's draining all this fluid into larger and larger cavities until it eventually reaches the largest cavity, which is your renal pelvis. Your renal pelvis. And your renal pelvis will take all the fluid, take all the fluid and drain it into your bladder. And this long drain is called your ureter. Your ureter. So these are your ureters. Goes into your bladder, pee it out. That's how your kidneys drain the fluid. And we'll, again, we'll talk about the function in later videos, but this is just a video on anatomy. So that's how your kidneys drain the fluid. There are some key important anatomy facts that I want you to know, especially when it comes to the ureters. When it comes to the ureters, you see your ureters go under important structures. Your ureters will go underneath the uterine artery in women, the vas def in men and it'll course nearby the iliac artery in both because we both have iliac arteries right around your pelvis why is this important well you can imagine if you're doing surgery around these areas <clears throat> if you're doing some sort of gyne surgery and you're messing with the, your, your your uterine artery then you can cut the ureter and if you cut the ureter what do you think what do you think is going to happen you won't be able to urinate yeah or you're messing around with the vast death in a man and you cut the ureter. What do you think is going to happen? You won't be able to urinate. And so cutting ureter is a huge, huge complication. Huge complication. You gotta, gotta know that. So ureters go under these structures. A lot of times <clears throat> they'll talk about, uh, questions I've gotten, they'll talk about someone that's going into surgery. They'll say, something dealing with the uterine artery. So they're going for a hysterectomy or something. And then the surgery goes well, but as the patient is post-op and recovering, they start developing flank pain. They start developing urinary incontinence. What do you think might have happened? They cut the ureter. Then they might ask some anatomy questions. What's the relation between the ureter and the uterine artery? It goes underneath it, okay? So that's some ways they can throw that at you. Very, very common question. You gotta know that cold. 
This is a pathway, a normal pathway of how your kidneys will filter and drain the fluid, but you can imagine there could be some obstructions. Common obstructions, right where your renal pelvis meets your ureter, we call this your ureteral pelvic junction, what a fitting name. There can be an obstruction there. In fact, there's commonly an obstruction there because this is during embryology the last place to canalize, to open up and allow drainage. So it's the last place to canalize, so you can imagine there could be obstructions there. There can also be an obstruction when your ureter go near your iliac artery. It goes near your iliac artery and your pelvis, so we call this pelvic obstruction or pelvic inlet obstruction. And the last place it can get obstructed is when your ureters connect to your bladder. Connect to your bladder. We call this junction the ureteral vesicle, vesicle meaning bladder, junction. So the junction between your bladder and your ureter. This can also get blocked. So as always, know the normal anatomy and then know what can go wrong. You know about the obstructions. Know that your ureters can get cut if you're messing around with these other structures, okay? Those are your kidneys. And we say your kidneys get blood, plasma, filter, and then you pee out any excess crap as urine. What is the blood supply to your kidneys? Well, the arterial supply. Let me draw in red, nothing that's fitting. The arterial supply of your kidneys is going to be your renal artery. <laughs> Not too hard to remember. And the venous supply of your kidneys is going to be your renal vein. Now your IVC, your inferior vena cava, is on the right. And so you can imagine your right renal vein will connect right to it. Nice and short, nice and easy. Drain the venous blood. However, your left kidney, your left renal vein will have to kind of go over. It's a little bit longer. Why is that important? This is good for kidney transplants just because you have a little bit more, I guess, vessels to work with. So just know that the left renal vein is longer and it should be longer because it's on the other side of the inferior vena cava, okay? Something else that's very important is your gonads. Let's just draw your gonads. Your right gonad is gonna go right to the IVC, nice and easy. Your left gonad is a little bit further from the IVC. So it says, hey, can I hit your ride? to your left renal vein. And your left renal vein being the great friend it is, we'll say, sure, you can hit your ride. And it'll join the left renal vein and then it'll travel over to your IVC. Why is this important? Because you can imagine if there's any sort of venous congestion of your left renal vein, then it'll back up into your left gonadal vein. So you might have left renal pathology and then all of a sudden you develop left-sided varicocele or left testicular pathology. And they might ask you why is because their veins are connected. Or they might ask you, a patient has left renal cancer and then it spreads to their left testicle. Why? Because their veins are connected. That is very, very commonly asked, so please know it well. I think that does it for some general anatomy. Let's talk about some physio. Let's talk about urination. We say your kidneys drain into your bladder via your ureters. Your bladder will fill up with urine and then you'll eventually pee it out. Well, how exactly do you pee it out? Let's understand the physio of urination. The muscles of your bladder, call it the truser muscle, the truser muscle. So fluid will go in and start filling your bladder, start stretching your detrusor muscle, start stretching your bladder muscle. But nothing really leaks out because we have a nice sphincter inside. We call this your internal sphincter. That keeps things nice and shut. 
And if that wasn't enough, we have another sphincter on the outside. We call this your external sphincter. And if that wasn't enough, we have muscles on the bottom, on the floor of your pelvis, we call your pelvic floor muscles. Pelvic floor muscles, which help support your sphincters and your urethra. All right, so a lot of that's just holding it back. That way you don't just pee anytime fluid goes into your bladder, right? So fluid goes in, starts stretching your detrusor muscle, everything's kind of holding it back, but it'll keep stretching, it'll keep stretching, it'll keep stretching, and that will send a signal to your brain that says, you know, I can't hold it back anymore, I need to pee. And your internal sphincter muscle is made out of smooth muscle. What's the importance of that? If you've done MSK, you know that smooth muscle is involuntary. Involuntary. And so your internal sphincter muscle will, and so your internal sphincter muscle will open. And fluid will leak till it hits your external sphincter muscle. Your external sphincter muscle is, thankfully, skeletal muscle. And if you've done MSK, you know skeletal muscle is voluntary. That means we can decide whether or not to open the sphincter. And if it's in an inappropriate place, let's say you're in Bible study and you don't want to pee, then you say, hey, I'm not gonna pee right now. And you close that sphincter. If you say, hey, I'm out of the urinal, I can pee now, then you voluntarily open that sphincter. Urine comes out. All is good. Done. That is how you urinate. Now, sometimes, Things don't go as planned. If you can't urinate as planned, we call that incontinence. Urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence. There are a few types. One of them is called stress incontinence. We said your bladder will fill up with fluid, but all these things stop you from just peeing willy-nilly. Your internal sphincter, your pelvic floor, your external sphincter, all these things stop you from peeing willy-nilly. However, if these are weak, then nothing's stopping you, yeah? And stress incontinence is due to weakness in these muscles. So due to weakness in sphincter or your pelvic floor muscles. You can't stop yourself, so <clears throat> if you cough, <coughs> or if you strain, or if you're weightlifting, then the fluid will just leak out. Nothing's stopping you. So I'll say history of incontinence with straining. Cough is an easy one. You just ask the patient to cough in your office. And if urine comes out, then it's stress incontinence. So coughing, straining, sneezing, all that stuff. What causes that weakness in the first place? Well, OBC could be one because you're putting so much weight and you're kind of sitting on these muscles. A uh, big one is pregnancy. Pregnancy, delivery of the baby just because it's traumatic and can really damage or wear out these muscles. All right, obesity, pregnancy, can cause this. So what would you, so what are you gonna do about it? Well, you know the problem, these weak muscles, so, what do you think we're gonna to do to fix it? We're gonna try and strengthen these muscles. We can do muscles to strengthen these muscles called Kegel exercises. Kegel exercises. Some pharmaceutical things we can do, we can do alpha agonist. Alpha agonist seems to increase muscle tone. Again, trying to strengthen those weak muscles. All right. There is a kind of a trick way they like to ask this on the step. Instead of saying stress incontinence, which kind of gives it away, they instead say urethral hypermobility is seen on exam. If they say urethral hypermobility is seen on exam, then it's stress incontinence, okay? What the heck is urethral hypermobility? Well, if all these muscles are weak, then 
they won't be able to support your urethra and your urethra is kind of like flopping around. Can you see that on physical exam just by looking at the urethra? No, you can't really see that. So what they do is they put a Q-tip, the back end of a Q-tip into the urethra and then they ask the patient to strain or cough. And because your urethra is floppy, then when you strain, <laughs> then the, the Q-tip will fling around. That's urethral hypermobility. And that's just a fancy way of saying you have weakness in these puzzles, okay? Let me put a star here. Every stress incontinence question I've ever gotten never just said stress incontinence. They always said urethral hypermobility. So that's like a, a buzzword, if you will. Let's talk about some other causes of incontinence. You can have urgency. This is when you're just sitting down. The, the history will be of, of a patient just sitting down, minding their own business, and then suddenly they have the urge to urinate. And they're running to the bathroom. Sometimes they don't make it in time. Urgency. Name gives it away. What causes that sudden urge? Well, what causes that sudden urge in the first place? Didn't I say it was due to your detrusion muscle enlarging, enlarging, and then sending a signal to your brain? Well, in urge incontinence, there's something wrong. Your detrusor muscle is sending signals inappropriately. So it's sending signals when there's no urine, when there's some urine, when there's a lot of urine, just sending signals willy-nilly. So in urgency, you have an overactive detrusor, overactive detrusor muscle. That is another buzzword. They might say, Detrusor hyperactivity. Ooh, that sounds fancy. <laughs> it just means your detrusor muscle is sending these signals to your brain when it shouldn't be. You get the urge all of a sudden. That is a pathophys of it. How do we treat it? Well, we can try conservative treatment, kind of re relaxation techniques and all that stuff. But if you want to know the farm, which again is commonly tested, is going to be anti-muscarinics like oxybutynin. Anti-muscarinics stop you from defecating, urinating, stop that signal transmission. That's why it's so good. So oxybutynin, anti-muscarinics. Put another star over here. You can have overflow incontinence. This is when you're not able to pee out for whatever reason. Let's say you have a tumor here and that's blocking your normal urination. Then it'll start to back up and fill up your bladder, fill up your bladder, and a little bit of fluid will leak out. All right, so you'll just be leaking fluid or you'll be dribbling or sometimes you'll have trouble fully voiding. All these will be in the history, so all right, dribbling, problem voiding, or feeling you haven't fully voided, all that stuff due to some sort of obstruction or inability to pee. The most common is gonna be benign prostate hyperplasia, by far. Most old men will have this. This is kind of the natural progression of things. You can also have, like I said, tumors, or neuropathy. If the nerve goes out and you can't pee, then It'll build up and build up and build up and start dribbling. So diabetes is a big cause. And then last but not least, mixed incontinence. And this one is very easy. Mixed incontinence has features from all of these. Okay, so not everything fits into a nice, neat box. Mixed incontinence takes care of that. All right, that does it for the general anatomy of the kidneys. Next video, we'll talk about embryology. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.